Good morning. It is 10.23 in the morning and I am about to quit my job. It's now 11.46 and I've officially done it. I have given my notice. <laughs> All right, we're back. Some of you may have come from TikTok. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cece. I went to Yale for undergrad and then Harvard Law. I've been working at large law firms called Big Law for the past five and a half years, where last year as a fifth year associate, I made about $350,000. And that was working on a reduced hour schedule of 80%. So kind of a sweet gig. But as you saw, and as the title of this video suggests, I am quitting. Why? Well, I have three major reasons. Okay, but before we get into it, I want to clarify that my reasons for leaving Big Law and my observations that I'll be talking about are garnered not only from my own experiences, but also discussions and things that have happened to my coworkers and my friends across many different law firms as well. I was editing this video and thinking to myself, God, Cece, like, I hope no one thinks that this is one gigantic subtweet because it's really not. I actually think that I have had a great experience in big law. I've been on reduced hours for the past two years and I've had an incredible amount of flexibility that is virtually unheard of in big law. I stayed in big law way longer than I expected to and that's wholly due to how amazing the people I work with are and the amazing culture that they cultivated. It was truly, truly a privilege to work with them. It made my decision to leave really difficult because they are a tough act to follow. Ultimately, leaving is still the right choice for me. Reason number one, I do not want the partner's lives. I love the people with whom I work. I respect them. I think highly of them. I cannot believe the practices that they have built for themselves. And yet, I do not want to be them. First, they work so much. Often they are online at least one day on weekends, usually Sunday, but sometimes both. Even when they go on vacation, they need to check email intermittently. It was very common for partners to put up out of office messages, good for them, that will say that they will check their emails once in the morning and once in the evening and respond to things on an as needed basis. And you kind of need to do it. It's very, very difficult to totally, totally unplug, especially as a partner, because the partner has their own relationship relationship with their clients. Last minute client demands can lead to canceled plans and canceled dinners. I'm no stranger to the schedule. And although I could work these demanding hours as I was starting out, gaining new skills, all of that, I really can't work this kind of schedule nonstop for the rest of my career. When I told my partner that I was thinking about quitting, he told me that he never expected us to hang out on weekdays, like ever. He never really pressured me or guilted me about my hours or job demands in our relationship. But the fact that he was telling me now made me feel a little bit guilty about the fact that I was just prepared to do a job that does take a lot from you and demand a lot of your time. Time that could be spent with your loved ones. Second, partners have to service client demands, even when client demands are unreasonable. The general tenor of big law is if clients say jump, we say how high. Given how high our rates are, and they are very, very high, it's not uncommon for associates to bill out at over $1,000 an hour. Some clients expect 24 seven, 365 turnaround. Same day or next day turnarounds are not uncommon in big law. Sometimes the urgent task that you had isn't even reviewed by the client until much, much later, and it becomes clear that it was a fake fire drill. Your client's disorganization ends up becoming your problem. And if it's a firm client or a client of another partner, you can't really tell them no. I've witnessed clients treat partners, even really high powered partners within and outside of the firm, totally disrespectfully. And the partner just kind of have to deal with it. Third, it turns out that partners individually don't actually have the power to effectuate the changes that I thought that they could. I never intended on staying in big law forever, but as I got more senior and there was a part of me that saw, hey, I'm still here. Maybe if I could, then I should. Because while 48% of associates are women and 12% of associates are Asian, just over 4% of partners are women of color. And that's not even getting into the whole equity, non-equity distinction. There was a part of me that thought maybe if I made partner, I would have it made and I could effectuate the changes that I wanted to see within the industry. But as I've gotten a little bit more senior, I've also been able to see a bit more behind the curtain. I've seen that making partner doesn't necessarily make your schedule better or that you've like made it. In fact, there are tiers to partnership. It's like once you've actually made the climb up the ladder to becoming partner, you think you've made it, but there's actually just a never ending series of ladders for you to climb. And unless you're the chair of the firm, a top rainmaker within the firm, 
you can't really shake the boat that much. Big law firms at the end of the day are very, very old institutions with very old traditions and law as a general field tends to be pretty averse to change. Knowing my personality, Enneagram type three, I know that I wouldn't be content and would be really frustrated if I got to partner and realized that I couldn't actually institute the changes in policy and practices that I wanted to see. Last year, when I was a fifth year associate, I talked to a lot of partners to try and figure out their path to partnerships and also what pot of gold lay at the end of that rainbow. Every partner I talked to could at most effectuate small policy changes or changes within their particular group, but the kind of sweeping broad changes to work like balance or diversity and inclusion, that was apparently more difficult for an individual partner to actually make. Of course, as more associates who want to make these changes go for partnership and become partners, the tenor and culture of the partnership writ large might change, but that's a hefty condition that needs to be satisfied. The second major reason of why it was time to leave was upon reflection, it was time in my life to take a risk. From a young age, I've always been good at achieving whatever goal someone set in front of me. I never met a ladder that I didn't love to climb. My parents immigrated to the United States when I was young and when they brought me over, they stressed me that financial security was of paramount importance. In college, I wanted to major in English, but my mom insisted that I major in economics because it seemed more practical and like it would give me the opportunity to work on Wall Street after graduation. I didn't enjoy any of it. Ironically, the good thing about going to a school like Yale is that you could theoretically major in theater studies or really anything and still get a job on Wall Street after graduation. But I didn't know that. And my parents who didn't go to college in the US also didn't know that. Not knowing what else to do, I remember taking some law and technology classes that I had really enjoyed and enjoyed way more than my economics courses. So like a lot of smart but confused college students, I decided to do what I was demonstrably good at doing, taking another standardized test and going to more school. I purposely only applied to top schools and I ended up going to a top school, which pretty much guarantees you a job in big law after graduation. Recently, I read the New Yorker profile of the author Min Jin Lee, who coincidentally was also a corporate lawyer for a couple of years before quitting. And the opening line in one of her novels is competence can be a curse. When the reporter asked about this theme, she said, I think this happens to a lot of high functioning people. We think that we can do everything. And in the process of doing everything, we don't do the thing that matters the most. We don't do the things that take the greatest risk because we are so competent. And often we're overtaxed by our competence and we don't know that. That really resonated with me. I'm now 30 and I realized that I have always taken the path of near guaranteed financial success rather than a riskier path that might have actually made me happier. 30 isn't old though. And as I looked around my life, I realized that I'm still at a place in my life where it's okay if I don't make $350,000. While I do still have student debt, I have actually paid down the majority of it and have gotten comfortable with the idea of reducing my payments and paying over a longer period of time. Many lawyers I know are still paying off their student loans 20 plus years after graduation. It sucks, but it's manageable, especially because I don't yet have two other major expenses in my life. First, I don't have kids or education funds or college funds to worry about. Second, I don't have a mortgage yet and I can always choose to move to a cheaper apartment or push comes to shove back in with my parents, which while it would be personally embarrassing for a bit, is not as messy as it would be if I had a default on a mortgage. Finally, I do recognize that I'm in a privileged position where while my parents did have their fair share of financial insecurities, they've since become financially stable and are able to pursue their best lives without leaning on or requiring my help. That safety net that I so wanted at 22, I now have at 30. I have great degrees and great experience in a practice area that is in demand. If everything falls apart, I can always apply to law firms again big law, smaller shops, in-house, I don't know. When I was 22 and fresh out of college with no experience, I wasn't really sure who would hire me. But at 30 and with my experience, I'm pretty sure someone out there in the world would hire me. I, I hope. <laughs> I also have a partner with whom I live who has a stable job and on whose health insurance I can go on to. This is huge. Taking risks alone is not only difficult emotionally, but also financially. And without a partner or family or some other safety net, like a trust fund. It can be really, really hard to take a financial risk. Lastly, and of course I have to mention this, I really lucked out by starting TikTok during the pandemic. Not only has it given me the chance to connect with you all, but it's also shown me that there are other opportunities out there to pay my rent. I started taking on paid partnerships at the end of last year, and I made about $30,000 in three months, just from responding to some brands that I liked who had reached out to me. Am I sure I can replicate that? No, but I do think it's worth trying. And the third major reason, 
ownership. I remember when I was about to enter the workforce, my mom kept on extolling the virtues of being your own boss and having your own business. At the time, it really confused me because I didn't feel ready to have responsibility for anything. I was a baby lawyer who had only really done two things very well for their entire life, read and take tests. I didn't feel ready to have responsibility for anything, much less my own business. I was thrilled that a law firm out there was willing to pay me $180,000 to do literally anything. Six years later though, and I kind of get it. I'm not talking about ownership of the profits of my labor, which is a separate discussion, but more the ownership of ideas. In legal practice, you can explore your own ideas to a certain extent, more so as a partner than as an associate, but at the end of the day, you're advocating for other people's ideas, you're interpreting other people's words and other people's laws. It's certainly useful training to answer other people's questions and interpret other people's words at the very beginning. But after a while, I've developed my own questions and ideas that I wanna explore and communicate to the public. At this point, you're probably wondering what are these questions and ideas and projects that I keep on alluding to. First, I want to try my hand at pursuing my childhood dream that seemed too risky for me to pursue at the time being a writer. It's funny because I remember in middle school, my favorite class was always English. And when I thought about the idea of becoming a writer, I always said to myself, oh, but you'll probably have to write under a pseudonym or change your last name because no one is going to know how to pronounce Shia and no one is going to want to publish a book that has Shia with an X as the last name of the author. Those times have clearly changed. I signed with a literary agent last year and I've been working on a couple book ideas. One of them that I need your help with. This first book idea is something that I've talked a lot about, big law culture. I've shared some of my experience with you all and I want to hear your stories as well. What are your horror stories? What are the horror stories that are whispered and passed down from associate to associate? What about the practices that made lovely oases within the toxic swamp at large? I want to hear it all and I promise you that it will remain anonymous. I spoke with a reporter last year about work-life balance and a few months after our discussion, they actually emailed me to say that they had to cut the story. The reporter stated, it's been much more difficult than I expected to get lawyers to talk candidly about their experience with work-life balance, COVID, and their career goals. That is so disappointing. As a profession, we need to do so much better about the isolation and opaqueness of working as a lawyer, especially in big law. So I've decided that I'm gonna talk about it. And if you'd like to join me in this conversation with the ability to remain as anonymous as you would like, please contact me at the form that I will link to below. I may not be able to change big law culture as a partner, but I still wanna try in whatever way I can. Second, I applied to a PhD program. There's only two PhD in law programs in the US, which are geared towards years of additional research and publications and law reviews with the aim of becoming a legal academic. I applied to the one at Yale, my beloved alma mater, and it has certainly been an interesting process. That video will be coming next week, so if you're interested in seeing me have the highest of hopes, but also the troughs of numerous mental breakdowns, be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it when it comes out on Tuesday. Third, I'm going to spend a lot more time making content for you guys. In addition to TikTok, where I'll be posting more frequently, I'll also be uploading YouTube videos on a weekly basis on Tuesday. I'll delve in more depth into what big law lawyers actually do, share stories and insights from my time in school as well as at my various firms, and any other information that you guys might be curious about, including, and I really hope to get this off the ground, interviews with my friends in various practice areas. I've always found it really infuriating that when you ask lawyers what they do, sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, it's too hard to explain. I thought it was dumb before I knew what they did, and now that I know what they do, I think it's even dumber that they don't explain very well what they do, nor how much time they spend doing it. Like, yes, it does take some thought to explain, but it's not rocket science. I certainly didn't know what being a lawyer, especially at a large law firm, would be like, and I'd like to demystify that for everyone so you can make a more informed choice about what to do with your life. I'll also be uploading vlogs as I do enjoy making those and sharing certain parts of my life with y'all. In addition to digital content, I'm also very, very excited to announce the launch of my weekly newsletter that will go out on Thursday. So YouTube videos on Tuesdays and newsletters on Thursdays. In it, I'll answer some of the questions that you've submitted to ask CC in writing so that you can always refer to it. Links to interesting articles that I've read that week, including about privacy law or technology law, give book and product recommendations, and really any other life hacks or templates that I think would be helpful to share. If you'd like to sign up, I'll leave the link to sign up below, and you can always give me any feedback about additional sections that you would like to see in my newsletter. You can also submit ask CC questions that I'll answer in the newsletter. I'll also leave that link to ask me a question. Whew. If you've made it through all of this, 
Thank you for watching. I hope this video was helpful to you. If so, I'd appreciate you giving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more. If you want to follow my journey into the great unknown, please subscribe on here, follow me on other platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, and sign up for my weekly newsletter. And if you have big law horror stories or friends who have big law horror stories, let's chat. I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't scared witless about quitting big law, but I feel really blessed to have had the experiences that I've had and I'm excited for what's to come, even if it doesn't go exactly as I planned. I know it's not done yet and there's still a long way to go, but I keep thinking about all it took to get here. Doubting myself, going back and forth about what I wanted, being scared to waste my time and look stupid in case none of it worked out. And then I realized that it was all in my head. You know, no one was doubting me except for me. I had to believe that it would work out for it to work. So do you? Believe it'll work out? I'm okay with finding out. <laughs>